All right, are you guys happy Easter? Uh, welcome, glad you're here. Uh, we, this, whole, this whole season, this Easter season, the, the kind of the, the Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter, we've been calling it, it's a nice little story. Um, and the reality is, what we're trying to do is peel that back a little bit. Um, well, sometimes I'm afraid we've made all of this into a nice little story, kind of like Disney has made all their nice little stories. Uh, and it always ends out nice and good, and it's always pretty, and it's about uh, Cinderella, or it's about uh, Snow White, or whatever. Uh, but really, it wasn't such a nice little story. It was a tough story. It's a hard story. It's a difficult story. In fact, Palm Sunday is really about this. It was really the illusion of peace is what we talked about in, in effect, is that Jesus came and they're all announcing him, you know, praise him, Hosanna to the son of David, peace among those on earth. But the reality was that peace lasted very short, right? I mean, on, on the next day, Jesus came into the, into the city of Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he turned the tables over and he cleansed it out. And, all, and everything from there for the whole, the rest of the week went downhill. Um, and it was really the illusion of peace. And then last night we talked about really this, is that Good Friday is really the disruption of peace. A disruption at a level that is almost hard to comprehend. In the lives of those who were there th during that time and really in our own lives, that if Jesus simply went to the cross and died, um, it all of a sudden this hope that was kind of building, it was... It was destroyed. It was disrupted. And the very thing that in our own lives we ache for, don't we? We really ache for the peace and the goodness and the beauty um, and, of life. We ache for that. And yet every day there is a disruption of that. We live in a world where that peace has been disrupted. And we talked about it uh, on Friday, the fact that if Jesus simply died on the cross and that was it, where does that leave you? Where does that leave you? At the end of that day, the very last things that Jesus had to say on the cross was that it is to tell us it is finished. You can interpret that in lots of different ways. It felt like on that day he was saying, it's over. The dream is over. This incredible thing that was going on is over. It's done. And then he gave up his spirit and he died. And they put him in a grave. You can imagine all the followers that he had, all the people, and what it did to them, the discouragement, the, uh, the sadness, really the destruction in their own lives, that it was over. Where are they going to go now? Who are they going to go see? What are they going to do? Where are they going to find hope? It is done. The amazing thing is, is that maybe when he said to Telestai, it went far more farther than that. They didn't understand it at that point. But he said when it's finished, it's paid in full. Everything that has to be paid for has been paid for. They didn't realize it, did they, until, until Easter morning. And here's really today what we're going to talk about, is we're going to talk about the presence of peace. All of a sudden, the peace that they sought was present with them. And so this morning... Really, I, I'm going to break this into three pieces like any good preacher would do. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but I don't have a poem at the end, just so you know. And, uh, but we're going to talk about this. First of all, we're going to talk about the divine conspiracy. You see, there's a conspiracy going on. In fact, this whole story about Jesus, his whole life, and really this last week, is all about conspiracies that are piling on top of one another, right? There's all sorts of conspiracy is when, when two people make a secret plan to disrupt and destroy someone else's plan. That's what a conspiracy is. And there were conspiracies happening all the time. Remember Judas went, and he went to, uh, to the religious leaders, and he said, I'll, f I'll give him up. I'll betray him, 30 pieces of silver. They made a conspiracy in order to, to break it up. There are other conspiracies that we're going to see here. And the first one is a divine conspiracy. A divine conspiracy is really this, the collaboration with the collab collaboration with God here and now where he is, a, he is working to renew his creation. God is unfolding a conspiracy where two or more are working to destroy the plans of someone else. That the Godhead, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are planning something to destroy the plans of somebody else. And it's a divine conspiracy that's going on in their lives. Let's look at this in Matthew 28. We're just going to walk through this chapter because I think it starts with this divine conspiracy. Here's what it says. Now, after the Sabbath, after the Passover was over, after the day of no activity, 
early on the first day of the week. That would now, Sabbath would, for them would have been Saturday. So on the first day of the week, uh, at dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Now, if we look in the other, uh, the other Gospels, this other Mary. Uh, I, I don't know if I really like Matthew just saying, and the other Mary. How would you like to be the, the other Mary? I have a feeling they've had a discussion in heaven when she goes like, Matthew, really? You just described me as the other Mary? You know, this is the Mary, son, the mother of James, it says in the other Gospels. At least they were polite enough to introduce her. Um, but here is Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and they went to the tomb. And they went there to take spices, to finish the dressing uh, of the dead body. Uh, it couldn't have been a, a, a very enjoyable assignment. Um, the sadness had to be profound in their lives. Uh, and they went to kind of hopefully see if they could get into the tomb and finish the dressing of the body. Uh, because they would leave it in the, these tombs uh, until it decayed. So they put it in this wrapping, and then maybe a year later or more after the body had totally decayed, they would go into these tombs, and they would take the bones, and they'd put them in these ossuaries. They are, they're these, these um, stone boxes, and then they would bury those uh, together with other ossuaries. And so... Um, that's what was going on here. And then in verse 2, he says, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Now, supernatural. I, I can't explain it. All I can do is this, is, is that God did something unique to roll back that stone that those women could never have done on their own. And so something supernatural happens here, and it's a great earthquake, and it rolls back. And then it says in verse 3, in his appearance, oh, I'm sorry, and sat on it. Oh, wait a second. And the Lord descended, let's go to verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that picture. It seems kind of interesting to me. He just rolls it back and then he just sits on it. It's like a teenager, you know, just they get a big rock. What do teenagers like to do? They just go sit on a big rock. You know, they climb up on top of it, and they sit on it, and they kind of look around. And that's exactly what this guy's doing. And he, this angel just sits on top of the rock, says, I did that. The earthquake did that. And, and so these ladies are fearing. So, and it says that his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. Wow, this very angelic figure. He is an angel. Just sits there having done this. And it's clear and then in verse 4, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Now, here's the deal. It's the only gospel that mentions this, that there, were, there was a, a guard, a set of Roman guards that were set there to protect this tomb. And when they, they, they feared having seen this and they trembled, and somehow, it, evidently, they fainted. I mean, it was so overwhelming what they saw that they were like dead men. Wow, that's incredible what happened there. Look at the verse 5. But the angel said to the woman, the women as they arrived. Now, I don't know what it looked like for them. It, they kind of come across a, some sort of a, a war zone. You know, they come, and here's all these Roman soldiers passed out. You know, and, and, and here's this angel. And the angel says to the women, hey, you guys, don't be afraid. It, it seems to me there was probably good reason to be afraid, right? There had been an earthquake. The stones rolled back. There's a bunch of shoulder, soldiers laying around looking like dead men. And they've got to wonder, was, did something happen here? And the angel says, hey, don't be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen. Now, you guys, they, they had processed this a little bit. Jesus had told them many times that he would come and be crucified. And that three days later, he would rise from the dead. It didn't make a lot of sense to them. It's not like that's an everyday occurrence, right? I mean, this is going to be weird. This is going to be odd. This is going to be supernatural. This is going to be difficult. Um, and, and, but he says to him, hey, he has risen. And you've got to imagine the, you know, the old hard drive just starts zooming in their brain. You know, like, oh, my gosh, what do you mean he's risen? I kind of, he talked about this, but I didn't know this is what it would look like. I didn't know this is what it would feel like. Oh, my gosh. And then he says, not only that, but come and see the place where he lay. Give him evidence. Let him come into the tomb. Let him see where he'd been. The other Gospels tell us that there, there are the, the burial clothes laying there on, on the edge or on the ledge that would be inside this tomb. And it says that the headpiece was folded up and separate from it. Very, very organized deal. I don't know if Jesus did that, if he's the one who folded it, you know, a very type A. I don't know for sure. If he's, uh, 
Exactly. Or it wasn't the angel or whoever. In our family, it would have been Diane who folded it up. I would have just gotten out of the clothes, you know. And, uh, uh, but uh, here it's, it goes on. Um, and he says, come and see where he lay. And it was like that. Oh, my gosh. One more step. Oh, my gosh. The stones rolled back. These dead soldiers, or at least what seems to be dead soldiers. He invites them into the tomb. Here's the, the burial cloth. And then he says, hey, go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. And then the angel, I love this. See, I told you. <laughs> you know, I told you, I've told you. And, and so he says, hey, he is risen. Go tell the disciples. Go quickly. I love this. Go quickly. Don't lollygag. Don't go anywhere. Don't go to Starbucks on the way. Hey, go quickly. And tell the disciples that he has risen and that he'll see them in Galilee. Wow, that's incredible. Can you imagine having been there? That this man, Jesus, who had said he was going to come and live a life unmatched by anybody ever, who said he would be crucified and rise from the dead. And it didn't make sense to his people very much, but all of a sudden, here it is. The one that they had grieved over, the one that they were lost without, and all of a sudden he says, you guys, I've risen from the dead. He has risen from the dead. Go tell the disciples. Now, you think, well, why didn't they come to the tomb? Well, in, in that day and age, it was the woman's job. That was the role of, that happened there. It was the women who dressed the body. Um, that was not something men do. So men, they're back in the upper room. They're back somewhere else, scared to death in an upper, in an upper room. And here he says, go tell them. I, I love that thought. This angel says, man, I want him to know. He wanted us to know. Go tell him. Wow, look at this in verse 8 then. So they departed quickly. Good, because they had been told to go quickly. So they departed quickly from the tomb uh, with fear and great joy. Kind of that whole mix. Doesn't that feel like life, really? I love that. They, they leave and they're scared to death. But they're also joyful. Isn't that kind of what we do in life? Isn't that kind of what you do almost every day in life? You get up. And there's great joy, there's beauty, and there's things that you fear, scared. Who knows what's going to happen? Yesterday morning, Jake woke up about 3.30 with a little more fear than joy as he had some problems in his, in his intestinal tract and figured out it was an appendicitis. Ends up on the operating table at about 10 o'clock. Was home by 2. Is that bizarre? <laughs> that is totally bizarre. We're glad you're here, bro. But there's, that's a mixture of life, isn't it? It's amazing. Well, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. <laughs> and behold, Jesus met them. Now, it says, I'll meet you in Galilee, but he met them. Now, he also meets them in the upper room later that day. And so he does appear to them before they get to Galilee. But the, over and over and over again in the Gospels, he says, tell them I'm going to meet him in Galilee, the very place we hung out with most of the time. The place that was the center of his ministry really was up in Galilee. He said, tell him I'll meet him there. I'll meet him at the favorite place. I don't know if you have a favorite place where you go on vacation, if there's a lake. And it's probably by the lake of, uh, of the Sea of Galilee, the lake of Tiberias was where he met them, uh, near on a mountain there. But he said, hey, meet me at the favorite place, you know, the place where we hung out before. And he says, I'm going to meet you there. Uh, and so then Jesus met him and he said, greetings. And they came up. And they took hold of his feet and they worshipped him. They recognized him. They knew him. And they worshipped him. Wow. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. See, the divine conspiracy is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all working to defeat someone else's plan. You see, when when... When they put Jesus on the cross, for, for all along, uh, Satan had been trying to destroy what Jesus wanted to do, right? At the beginning of his ministry, Satan came, sat down with Jesus and he tempted him. And he said, hey, you know what? I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you just worship me. And here's the crazy thing. All the kingdoms of the world were already his. It wasn't Satan's to give away. But he's trying to tempt him and trying to draw him in. And if Jesus said, would have said, well, okay, it would have destroyed what God was doing, right? Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. 
for all, for mankind. But if he could somehow, Satan could ruin that, then his plan would have been fulfilled. You know, when Jesus, when, when Jesus was on the cross and they kept saying to him, hey, save yourself, Jesus. Just say, all along the way, all you have to say is, hey, okay, I'm not the son of God. They would have stopped whipping him. They, would have, they wouldn't have nailed him on a cross. They would have taken him off the cross before he was dead. All he had to say is, no, thank you, this is too much. And Satan would have said, yes, I got him. And the world is mine. But he didn't do that. Jesus said, I've told you many times that I'm the son of God. I told you many times that I came to suffer. And that's what I'm doing. And he decided not to save himself so that he could save you and me, right? So that he could give his life for you and for me. Wow. And as a result of that death, when he said, to tell us by, it's over, it's paid in full, it's complete. I paid for the sins of the whole world. I had none to pay for for myself. I had only had Rick and Kevin and Philip and Anna. He had all I could pay for. And he took it on himself, the burden of it. Three days later, having proven that he was dead, he rose from the dead. And he said, I'll meet you where you live, guys. Most of these guys were from Galilee, right? He says, I'll meet you where, where you live. Wow. That's a divine conspiracy. Two or more that plan to ruin someone else's plan. Now, let's look at another conspiracy that's going on. In verses uh, 11 through 15, there's a human conspiracy that happens. It's still going on, even today. Look at this. And, uh, and this is the collaboration. The human conspiracy is the collaboration with man here and now where we are, to, we are at work destroying God's credibility. Truly, the conspiracy of man is to destroy God's credibility with man. Right? That he's really not able. He's not big enough. He's not worthy. We can either live our lives on our own plans, on our own accord. And here's the human conspiracy. Look at this in verse 11. It says, and while they were going, while, while the women were going to tell the disciples, it says, behold, some of the guard went into the city. Now they must have revived. Okay, so the guard, they didn't actually die. They just were passed out. And they revived, and they knew, oh my gosh, this is trouble. Right? I mean, this is the Roman guard. They, they had been, somehow the, vol the body was gone. They were in serious trouble. And they went into the city, and they, here's what they did. They went into the city, and they told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel the, with the religious leaders, here's who they went to. And it says, and they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people that his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. Look in verses 14, and if, and, if this, and, if it, and if this comes to the governor's ears, which it was going to, right? It's almost funny that he writes it, if it comes to the governor's ears. Like it wasn't going to be, you know, front page news. Uh, of course it was going to be front page news. And he says, but if it comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep him out of trouble. And keep them out of trouble. Wow, we'll keep you out of trouble, guys. You know, because if the Roman guard slept on their duty watch, the immediate punishment was death. So all of them messed up. And they were like, oh my gosh, what do I do? They went to the religious leaders and they said, hey, we'll cover it up with you. We'll make a conspiracy. And here's what we'll do. We'll keep you out of trouble in verse 15. So they took the money and did what they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day, some way destroying the cre credibility of God. We'll, we'll keep with the story that, the, that they came and stole the body. Somehow they got past this Roman guard. And isn't that really what we do even today with God in our lives? That we destroy the credibility of God. We somehow suggest he either isn't real or he is not able to handle what you, where you are. We continue to do it to destroy his credibility. What's going on in your life? What's going on in my life? That he either is not actually there or he is not able to address. And we destroy his credibility. That's what's going on here. We're just like that. We still do the same thing. It's an amazing thing. It is the human conspiracy that we are still all about. 
but the divine conspiracy was bigger. Now, let's finish this passage by talking about the Great Commission. So we have the divine conspiracy, we have a human conspiracy, but Matthew ends this whole thing with the Great Commission. And, and let's look at it, it's pretty incredible. Because it is our collaboration with God in renewing his creation in one life at a time. As a result of the divine conspiracy, in opposition to the human conspiracy, there is a great commission. Let's look at it. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee. Good, because that's where Jesus said he was going to meet him. It's super. Okay, so the 11 disciples went to Galilee and to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. He had told them, the very place, man, I'm going to meet you there. It's cool. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. They still weren't quite sure, some of them. And, and you can understand that, right? I mean, it'd be a little wild, a little crazy, a little hard. Some of them were absolutely there. Others were kind of struggling with it still. I love that. It's so honest, so real. I think it probably would have been like us if we'd have showed up there. We would have been, yeah, I get it. But I don't get it. I'm not sure. Is this really real? What's going on here? But then he says, and Jesus came to them and he said, hey, here's the deal, guys. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You guys, uh, let's think about that for a second. Jesus says, all authority in every corner of the universe is mine. I'm the one who came, took on human form, died for you, rose from the dead, never had any sin of my own. And God has given me, as, as God the Son, all the authority of all the universe, every square inch of it. That includes St. Louis, just so you know. That includes your house. That includes your life. That includes everything where you live. All authority has been given, and heaven and on earth has been given to him. And so he says, do this. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Okay, let's circle that. We haven't circled anything in a long time, so let's circle that thing. Uh, so let's circle that. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. H here's the deal. Sometimes we turn this into a program. You're going to take a class on discipleship. You're going to somehow, it's, a, it's some sort of a, a check the box kind of a deal. I, it's so not that. I mean, being a disciple is to be a follower of Christ, a follower of Jesus, and say, I, there is no place else for me to go. Remember when they said to Peter, Peter, do you think I'm the son of God? And he goes, yeah, uh, yeah, I do, but, but I don't have anywhere else to go but you. You're the only one that has any answers to my life. You're the only one who's addressed the issues of me. And, and it's really helping people to say, I want to be a follower of Jesus because that's really what life is really all about. Every time that I follow the world, I don't know about you, but every time I've done it, I reach a dead end. I reach a place of great grief and pain and sorrow and disappointment. And it's never really offered anything for me. I thought it did. It looked like it was going to. But at the end of that, it, there's nothing there. It's empty. And so that really to say, go and help people make, develop people who will follow Christ as a disciple of his, a follower of him. Say, that's what I want you to do. Because of the divine conspiracy, in opposition to the human conspiracy, I want you to go and make disciples, and not just disciples, but of all nations, of the whole world. Wow, that's incredible. Now, look at this. And there's, there's kind of three ways to do it. The first one is this. It's found in the first word. Though it doesn't show up, it's go. It doesn't show up in English as a participle, but it really actually is a participle, meaning in the going of life, in all of the going of life, in everywhere where you go, in everything that you do, be making disciples. St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel at all times, and if you have to, use words. It's right that everywhere we would go, we would help be helping people be followers of Jesus. And some are skeptics. Some of them say, I don't buy this for a second. You say, that's fine. Just live out your life like Christ. Some others are inquiring and saying, hey, help me understand this. And others of us are maybe already convinced, but still somewhat skeptical, right, when they doubted, sometimes still inquiring, and that we are helping people walk with Christ and, and by making disciples by in the going of life. Wow, okay. The second one is this, and the second line is baptizing. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing is this, in, in simplicity form, it is simply this, it helps identify you with someone else, right? Baptism, you identify with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. 
There's a new identity. When you come up out of there, it is a symbolism of having been washed clean of all your sin and that you're a new person. Behold, old things have passed away. New things have come. You have been transferred to the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Wow, that's an incredible deal. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and what he's done and the Son and he gave himself for you and the Spirit as he lives in you. Transforming your identity. Wow. And then in verse 20, teaching them to observe. It's really one word in the Greek. But you don't just teach them. You teach them to observe. One time I went to a conference, and, and, and the guy, it was a preacher's conference. It was, you know, it would be a bore for you guys. But, uh, you know, uh, so the guy's teaching, and he goes, here's the funny thing is most of you guys think that your job is to teach the Word of God. And we all were like, well, yeah. We kind of thought that's what it was, you know. And he goes, if you think that, I'm so sad for you. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, here it comes. <laughs> He's going to nail me somewhere. And he said, your job is not to preach the word of God. Your job is to teach people the word of God so that they know what it means and how to engage it and how to grow in it and how to have their lives transformed by it. you got to teach people. So if you're not teaching people, you're missing the boat here. you got to teach people the word of God. Teach it and teach them to observe all that I commanded you. Wow. You guys, so, the, so this divine conspiracy that is against this human conspiracy, that our job is then to go and make disciples and baptize them and, and help them be identified with Christ and that to uh, teach them to observe all that I commanded you. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. The one who rose from the dead, the one who took my sin upon himself, in your sin, to be a follower of him. And then the last line, let's just grab it here for a second. Let's circle it because it's a big deal. I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. You see, the risen Christ said he would be with us always. He has ascended to heaven in bodily form and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to be among us and to live in us. And he's coming back someday to get us. And we've talked about it before in Revelations. And he's going to come back and he's going to come on a white horse and he's going to have fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth. And he's going to be wearing a robe that's dipped in blood and on his thigh is going to be written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he is coming to take over. And it's not just a myth, it's true. And he says, I will be with you always until that day. I'll be with you. And it's this life we live. We don't have to do it on our own. We don't have to live it by ourselves. And he said, I'll be with you to help you live this life that I've called you to, to be a follower of me. You can't do it in your own power. You have to do it in the power of the Spirit because I'm going to be with you. Wow. So let's do this. So, therefore, what now? What do we do? So let me just walk through this really quickly. Because Christ has all the authority in the universe. Therefore, in the goings of our lives, right, in the where we go and what we do, and the fact that our identity has been fundamentally transformed, we've been made new people because of what he's done. We learn to obey his commands, right? We learn to obey him. And we can rely on his promise to be with us even to the end because, and it's because of this, that he is not here, but he is risen. Because he rose from the dead. He's alive. It's incredible. There's nothing we did. He did it on his own. And he told the ladies to come tell us. And not only did they come tell the disciples, but they told us. And he has risen from the dead. So here's a question for you. Here's what I have for you. It may not be a nice little story. It may not be a nice little story. It wasn't then and it probably won't be now, but what is the story that he wants to write in your life in the days and years to come as a follower of Jesus? What is it he wants to write? What would he like to do? What would he like to do in your life? What do you need to open up your arms to? For some of you, maybe this morning you're here and you really say, you know what? I'm a skeptic. I haven't bought this, but somehow it's starting to make sense. And I want to give him an open door to begin to do something in my life. Or maybe you're an inquirer. And you're saying, I've been looking for this, and I think I may be at a place where I'm ready to give him my life. 
because he is the one who is with us. And maybe you're in a place that you're already convinced that you say God is doing something new and he wants to move in a new place in my life. What is it that he'd like to do? As you leave today, we've got a, a really nice pencil and a piece of paper for you. We, didn't, we bought nice pencils. We didn't give you the cheapo. And we'd like you to take this. And we'd like you to take it home. And we'd like you to put it on your desk. A- and I'd like you to begin to sketch or write. I'd like you to sit down and ask God, God, what do you want to do in my life? If Jesus really rose from the dead, and, and really here we have Christ dying on the cross in this book. This is a really cool picture. But the next page is all about the fact that he has risen from the dead. But, but it's interesting, there's an empty page over there. Because that's the page that he'd like to do in your life. And so we ripped that page out, and we've got one for all of you. Um, to begin to write down, what does God want to do in you? I want you to sketch it out, draw a picture, write something, wrestle with it. And here's what we'd like you to do. If in the next week or two or three or whatever, if you'd like We want you to bring it back, and we can either post it, or if you'd like to explain it to this group of people, to tell them what God's saying to you, because this story isn't over, right? Jesus rose from the dead, and it's not over. He is writing out his story in your life and what he wants to do, and we'd like to invite you to that. But the reality is that this divine conspiracy that he is still unfolding is in your life because he has risen from the dead. He is not here anymore in this tomb, and he is alive. And that's what we worship him for. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. We thank you that on this particular day, we get to remember and celebrate not only the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, but he he is still alive and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he has never left us alone and all the authority that he has in all the world, he has called us to be a part of what he wants to do. To help people be followers of Jesus. And Jesus, I pray that you would help us to do that. And that we would identify ourselves with you and that we would obey you and that we would walk in the newness of life and the victory of who you are in the midst of a broken and lost and confusing, confusing world. But we celebrate for the fact that you are no longer in the tomb, but that you have risen, that you are alive, and you live in us. And today we celebrate and we worship you. And so together we want to worship you.